Hi, and welcome to the Foundations for Change video series, brought to you by the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance. In this video, Karen McLoon from ISET International will outline different ways to affect change and influence policy and spending for humanitarian and development objectives. So, a couple of the goals of the Alliance are influencing a substantial sum of money um, into pre-event action around flood resilience and improving the policy that, that dictates how that money is spent. So as part of the year, well, as part of every learning report, um, we take a look at how are we doing against those goals? Where are we progressing? What does that progress look like? And what has it taken to affect the change that we're seeing? And in the year two learning report, we generated this graphic to, to encapsulate what we were seeing in the reporting around how we are achieving change in how we're influencing policy and, and funding. And it's complicated. And so I'm really excited to have the opportunity to kind of walk people through this. Um, so if you if you look at the diagram you see sort of a tangle of things at the top that form one pathway with a couple of sort of side paths um, that link from the left side where we we begin with some initial stakeholder engagement to our ultimate goal on the right side where we have improved policy and increased investment in flood resilience um, at the bottom you see a very direct path. Um, and then between them, you see what happens if you don't do this work, which is flooding causes losses and damages, um, unless pre-event action is taken. That's where we're trying to get people to focus. Let's take action before events occur so that we don't have to you know, sort of experience those damages, those impacts, or that they're at least less and we can recover more quickly. So I'm going to start by talking about the, the top, more complicated path, because that's probably where the bulk of our work is. And that path is really highlighting three different things that we're seeing happening across the Alliance. The first is uh, we're having success in our influencing where we have teams that are working on not just community programming but really connecting that programming to advocacy um, and seeking to use the successes from the programming to influence both spending and policy um, across different levels in their countries so from local all the way up to subnational and national levels and the mexico red cross has had um, is one of our really shining examples of success in this with their community brigades program. What's been really impressive about that program is um, not just the way that they were able to institutionalize that in the Tabasco State Development Plan, um, not just the way they won awards from it, but the persistence with which they just kept building from really good community programming all the way up. They identified a need on the ground, um, both for faster response to disasters and for more sort of social cohesion around responding to flood disasters in their communities, um, built a mechanism that could help fill that gap, but then consistently communicated and took advantage of working with Zurich um, in Mexico to kind of amplify their voice and reach other um, stakeholders to just keep communicating the value of this work. Uh, and, and we've seen these really clear successes as a result of that. And so that, that successful programming really built credibility and then allowed their advocacy work to be informed by an understanding of what was needed to really affect change and make people more resilient on the ground. The second thing we see 
is um, success where Alliance has been able to leverage emerging and ongoing policy windows. This has been um, particularly um, visible in the work that Practical Action Nepal has done, where they ran the Flood Resilience Measurement for Communities tool. They were working with communities to really understand, okay, what does this tell us about this community? What does this tell us about where we might want to take action? But then they took that community understanding and the, the co-created actions that the community wanted to move forward with and brought it to the municipal stakeholders and were able to get it pulled into the annual planning process and therefore funded through the annual planning process. And so by knowing that, you know, when the windows were for this municipal planning, knowing the kinds of processes that they needed to feed into in order to influence those plans and get community priorities taken up in those plans, they were able to actually institutionalize some of the activities locally. And that required finding a common ground between the flood resilience work and broader policy issues to some degree. Um, so they needed to be able to translate what we were seeing and the language we were using in describing it to what was happening in the planning process so that there were clear ties between those. The third example on our somewhat complicated piece at the top um, of success has been where teams have a really long history of advocacy and established relationships. And we see this particularly um, because successful influencing requires trust and trust takes time. And so for the most part, the teams that we're seeing on the ground that are having the greatest policy and funding influence are the ones that have been doing this work for many years, not necessarily as alliance teams. There are a number of teams and certainly the Red Cross teams are among them where they're recognized in the country. Of course, they've played a very strong role for decades. Um, and bringing those relationships into the work makes a really big difference. So, so that encompasses a lot of this top path where we've gone from stakeholder engagement through um, kind of increased awareness of the Alliance and um, improved awareness of flood resilience. Those are different. Um, we, we both want people to know who we are as an alliance and what we're doing, but also recognize why resilience is a conversation we need to be having and what it takes to actually build flood resilience. The center circle um, really focuses on the way we're using knowledge in our work. And all of the three examples that I gave you on the previous slide leverage that knowledge. Um, knowledge of best practice on the ground, um, knowledge of how climate is likely to influence flooding in our communities and therefore why we need to be proactive and perhaps more proactive than we have in the past around flood resilience. Um, and, and clear examples of what it means to build flood resilience in useful ways for communities on the ground. These are all really powerful tools in then influencing policy and spending. This in turn leads to graining credibility within the Alliance um, and increased buy-in to what we're doing and interest in inviting us into policy dialogues. Um, more people come to talk to us, they invite us to speak and eventually that has led to increased policy influence and, and more investment. However, as I mentioned at the bottom of the slide, we have a shortcut. We didn't really recognize the shortcut directly from the reporting that we saw in year two um, until we worked on this diagram. And that's when we realized, yes, we are doing this work. We're consistently doing this work. We're building up this work, but many of our wins are also just places where we have political influence. And part of why we have that political influence is because we're working as an alliance because we have 
different organizations with different networks and different contacts with reputations that they've built over decades from really good work. Uh, it's because we combine research, which has one particular audience and network. Uh, we combine the humanitarian network that the IFRC brings in, the uh, more sort of traditional development networks of many of the other implementing partners, and Zurich, who have their own business network and a very different profile than the rest of us. And working together, um, we've been able to access spaces that any one organization alone couldn't. And that's been really powerful. And it's something that as we've more intentionally identified it, uh, we now I think can use more intentionally as well moving forward. And some of the wins that we've seen from that include things like access to major policy forums like Insurance Europe and the EU Commission for Flood and Climate Change policy tracks. And we're excited about furthering this. So just to reinforce, like this diagram comes from the work. It's not that we created a diagram about how we thought this would work. This is what we're seeing on the ground. One of the biggest things I would note is that we've started looking at the information, the reporting information for year three. And what we've realized is um, that our diagram needs to extend significantly to the right, that the work doesn't end when you have the improved policy. The work doesn't end when you have the funding earmarked. Um, there are still a lot of work at that point to make sure it's well spent, that the policy is actually enforced, um, that the funding flows the way it was intended. And so those are places that we're looking forward to exploring in future. Um, and it just highlights the way that this is kind of an ongoing learning process for everyone involved. <laughs>